So, uh, last time we talked about Wittgenstein's picture of reality. It's made up of facts and propositions being pictures of facts. So logic is the practice of ordering propositions, making their relations to each other clear. The propositions of logic are not actually supposed to be informative, right? He seems to think that a lot of the things that we might think are substantial claims about the world, like saying something is identical to itself. You're just making a stupid point about logic that is really very uninformative. In fact, even the informative sounding laws of logic, right? Like modus ponens, if A and if A then B, therefore B, they don't actually say anything about the world. They are senseless. They have no informational content. They only describe the language itself, not the world. So he's divided things that we could say as being either things about the world, which are parts of science, or things about language itself, which are parts of logic. And really, we should work towards an ideal language. This is Leibniz's project, where he wanted to maybe replace natural language with a logically transparent language. So all of the analysis of the different propositions would just be obvious. And a lot of what philosophy then is going to be doing with natural language is just turning it into that kind of language by making the logical relationships between our concepts clear. And those are the only two really legitimate things to talk about. Talk about the world or talk about language itself, logic itself. And if you're talking about anything that is not a potential object of experience, right, a thing in the world, if you're talking about, say, reality as a whole, as philosophers like to do, if you're talking about ethics, he picks out as being something over and above, things about the world that can be described, and all these other things that philosophy seem concerned with, our words just don't refer to anything. They're nonsense. So I think the key point for this to me is his very impoverished notion of what constitutes a state of affairs, which seems to be very uh, experiential, but experiential with a strong, strong, strong bias towards sensation, by which I mean visual and presumably auditory and so forth sensation. So the proposition, Seth is further south on the globe than Mark, is true. And that state of affairs holds in such a way that we can talk about it and it has meaning. And so we can say something meaningful about that. Then we can say, well, Seth is north of Wes, and that's false. So for him, that's useful ways to talk about it. And presumably all of the propositions of science are kind of like that. Bodies of greater density act differently than bodies of lesser density or, you know, a liquid with higher density sinks below a liquid of lesser density or something along those lines. And he says, that's okay. And then, like you said, you have the propositions about language, which are logical. But what it sounds to me like he's saying is the sentence, Seth is more righteous than Mark, that state of affairs doesn't exist or the term righteous is meaningless. And so that statement has no meaning. And so he rules it out. Is that a fair? Yeah, as empirically unverifiable, your emotions and your state of mind are empirically unverifiable. Yes. And I think in addition to being completely insane <laughs> to say anything like that, it's ridiculous because, I mean, I haven't gone through the exercise of trying to find an empirically identifiable fact that also contains a moral judgment that would take it outside of the realm. But if I said something like, Seth is a more moral human being than Jeffrey Dahmer, is there anybody in the world that would dispute that fact? Is there anybody who would say that that state of affairs was not true? Well, if you recast that in a purely descriptive way, that is, there are groups of actions that people call moral. And not to say they are moral, but people call them. And because there's this general consensus on what actions people consider moral, so in other words, we're just talking about what people's opinions are, we're not saying what the truth of the matter is, then, yeah, it's like saying that song is rock music and that song is jazz, because... People have developed pretty standard, you know, at least in some cases, you can make those categorical decisions. I mean, you, you can interpret it in the same way. Or as an Aristotelian, you might want to relate morality back to health and so on and so forth. But I think the stronger argument here has to do with talking about mental states. And I think that sort of encompasses the moral part. Okay, so here's kind of my two criticisms of this. The first is, it's not clear to me that all empirically verifiable states of affairs are as completely boring and pointless as 
the ones that he uses in his <laughs> examples and that for the most part are used in examples in 20th century analytic right. philosophy. Do you remember spending hours and hours with the cat? I was just about to say that. <laughs> okay. And, oh, I see a field of green and there's a point in it. And I yeah. mean, so for you to say that I cannot describe a state of affairs that's empirically verifiable, that contains any kind of meaning that extends beyond the realm of physical science. First of all, I question whether that's true. The second thing is, oh my God, what in the world would we be doing if all we did was talk about physical facts, <laughs> empirically verifiable physical facts, and the logic of language? I mean, if that were the pursuit of philosophy that you just spent your time pointing out how when people said interesting things about literature and philosophy and <laughs> ethics and all that was that you were caught up in a grammar mistake, <laughs> there would be no point in pursuing that's this. Awesome. And that's kind of like my huge bone to pick with this. So Wittgenstein was convinced he was right, and he was an insanely arrogant guy <laughs> in that respect. But what was the motivation? What could possibly motivate you to say, yeah, there's really no purpose in talking about anything that's interesting. Let's just turn the world over to Niels Bohr and his colleagues and then sit around jerking off. It's, <laughs> it's nightmarish. See, I think Wittgenstein, though, is less like that than, than Carnap because there's a lot of philosophical beauty. Yes, he became to, less like well, that. Well, no, but also even to the Tractatus, I think there's some cool metaphysical stuff going on. But I, I totally agree with you, Seth, and I think just to bring out this classic problem is that this principle of verifiability is, of course, not verifiable. Yeah, let's back up it's and give empirical. the relation of uh, Carnap and verificationism to the Tractatus here. Okay. So like we were saying, the Vienna Circle of logical positivists really took the Tractatus. They had some of these ideas floating around before the Tractatus, but they really liked the Tractatus and took this as a signal to declare war on metaphysics. And so the Carnap reading that we have provided a link to, he interprets Wittgenstein's main point here as saying that the function of philosophy is logical analysis of propositions, right? To show the logical relations between them. And one of the key parts of that, maybe the whole thing, is to find the verification for the proposition. The way he says it is, what reason do we have to assert that is true? So we can verify this either directly through perception or much more likely indirectly. And here's a quote. A proposition P, which is not directly verifiable, can only be verified by direct verification of propositions deduced from P, together with other already verified propositions. So he gives an example about if you're trying to determine if a key is made of iron, well, you do tests on it. You might not be able to just verify that it's iron, but you can do tests on it. So is it attracted by a magnet? You could do mechanical, chemical, optical tests. Each point, we know that iron is supposed to yield a certain result with the test, so at least it has a chance of failing. You might not conclusively be able to prove that it is iron, but you can get a better and better and better idea. But it's really saying that what this is iron means is it will pass all these different tests, right? It will show itself to have the same properties as things that we have determined to be iron. And so he thinks that you should be able to do that with everything. And so if you say, uh, there's a god, and you can't tell me which observations that's supposed to give rise to, right? What tests you could put to it, then it's meaningless, right? If it doesn't have a verification, either direct or possible indirect, it's a meaningless concept. And the, I think the problem is that it's not just God, it would be anything philosophical, including sure. the principle of verifiability. There's nothing that you can do to empirically verify that principle. You can give no argument for the principle of verifiability, except that it makes you comfortable because all the philosophical problems that worried you, you no longer have to think about, right? It tidies things up. Yeah. If you're a system builder, if your concern is how do I create a complete closed system and tie up all the loose ends and, and all that stuff, I'll go back to my point that I'm not sure the purpose of philosophical activity is to be a system builder. You know, even though there have been plenty of people that do that, it certainly misses the point of Wittgenstein, who was not trying to build a system. Yeah. At least I don't think he was here. And also, there are things that have, uh, like, for instance, the concept of God fulfills some conceptual role. It may do so illegitimately, but there's some problem that it's addressing and there's some motivation beyond a mere mistaken grammar. But again, I, I just think that the biggest problem with this, and I think the reason why it was ultimately abandoned, is that inevitably we make these 
philosophical and in the technical sense meaningless statements because whenever we make second level observations in other words and whenever we are reflective and turn the mind back on itself for instance or language whenever we try to talk about language or talk about relations you know it comes back to the ontological problem of relations that we were talking about with Bradley anytime you're talking about something formal it shows itself as Wittgenstein said and as showing itself as being structure you're going to fall into a whole lot of philosophical problems every time you try and treat form or structure as yet another object. So the idea is we have to avoid treating that as an object within our language, and any talk about that becomes meaningless. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself into philosophical problems. And I think the motivation for that, which is the avoidance of philosophical problems, is not strong enough to justify it. Obviously, you can't empirically justify creating these suppositions and rules to avoid those problems. And I think, again, other than that, the only other argument you can give for it is that, well, the world must make sense and we must be able to make sense of it completely. I don't know if that made sense, but... (laughs) Yeah, I kind of feel like I'm on the periphery of this. Like, I'm not taking it head on, that I'm just a little bit angry about it. So I'd like to try to understand and give a charitable reading and then you know, provide some kind of criticism of it. But I'm totally with you. I'm, I get so angry about this stuff. Well, I get as angry about this stuff as I do about relativism. So Mark, you're going to have to be the sober one. I do. I sympathize with first Wittgenstein's argument really against making any universal claims. That's the foundation of system building and, you know, right from Plato talking about the forms and stuff, the philosophy seems saying everything is water is like one of the examples that Carnap gave from ancient Greek philosophy. And how do you argue between everything is water and no, everything is the void? Actually, well, though, isn't that an example of an empirical proposition that doesn't count as meaningless? <laughs> Seriously. How so? I think he was giving that. He, he was saying that as ambitious or as absurd as those... Let's, let's read the actual... No, 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 no. He's, I'm probably he, he, wrong about this. Let's just, let's just read it. I do not include in metaphysical those theories, sometimes called metaphysical, whose object is to arrange the most general propositions of the various regions of scientific knowledge in a well-ordered system. But that's not... Uh, everything is water is not in that part. That's empirically verifiable, though. It's not metaphysical. You can test whether or not the world is made of water. Not if it's underlyingly made of water. Very famously, Plato came along and said that these sorts of quasi-philosophical and yet materialistic theories, because they're still essentially materialistic, and in that sense, you're dealing with something, you know, saying the world is made of, up of ideas in the platonic sense is dealing with something which I think of as unverifiable. Saying that it's made of water seems in a different category. Here's the quote. Now let us examine this kind of proposition, that is the metaphysical proposition, from the point of view of verifiability. It is easy to realize that such propositions are not verifiable. From the proposition, the principle of the world is water, we are not able to deduce any proposition asserting any perceptions or feelings or experiences, whatever, which may be expected for the future. Therefore, the proposition, the principle of the world is water, asserts nothing at all. Yeah, I see what he's Uh, saying. I think it's a bad example. I don't think it's very charitable to say that he's trying to say the entire world is understandable. It's that there are limits. This seems almost more Kantian to say there are limits to the th- kinds of things that we could understand. Yeah. But the difference is, and this is the difference with Kant, that, you know, as a strong Kantian, as is probably obvious by now, I absolutely agree with that. But Kant is very careful to say, you cannot talk about God, for instance, or freedom or soul as an object of science, and you get into huge problems with that. It's sort of Kant's version of the grammar mistake. If you treat the soul as an object that will behave as an empirical object and as something out there in the world to be examined, you'll get all sorts of errors. But that doesn't mean you can't talk about the soul, and that doesn't mean that you can't have rational thought about the soul. Kant distinguishes thought and knowledge. So it's just a matter of understanding the difference between those two activities. Yet defining science and coordinating it off from the metaphysical, I think, is an important enterprise. But saying that, that means that metaphysics is completely illegitimate, I think, is the step that I reject. Here, here. Well, I mean, isn't it just tied to that Cartesian desire for certainty 
right? That we don't want to call anything knowledge at all unless it is certain knowledge, unless it is clear and distinct. And so that their interpretation of that is empiricist. In fact, he quotes uh, Hume somewhere in here. Can I give the, the quote from Hume? It seems to me that the only objects of the abstract sciences are of demonstration or quantity and number. All other inquiries of men regard only matter of fact and existence, and these are evidently incapable of demonstration. When we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. <laughs> does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter, fact, and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Mr. That's, Grinch. That's, that's a quote from Carnap? From, it's in the Carnap, but it's a quote from Hume from Inquiry Concerning ah, Human Understanding. Okay. So, you know, I give Hume the benefit of the doubt, but not Carnap, because Hume at least was... And Kant was very motivated clever. by that. Humean skepticism, but as Kant phrases it, he finds a way to preserve faith. And, well, Hume creates problems even for science, and I think that's what Kant thought, because Hume debunks even causality. Um, yes. I think that's why he must be... For that yeah. yeah. That's Maybe why he must talk be talking about... about quantity and number there. And so Kant wants to get back causality, and he wants to save physics, for instance, and other things. He didn't think Hume saw the full implications of his skepticism, and he thought it would destroy science as well as metaphysics, so he thought he would get back science by providing a ground for causality, for instance. Right, other. so the, the famous part of Hume that I think you're referring to is, Hume says, what is causality? Why do we think that one thing causes another? Well, just because we see one thing, and then we see another thing coming right after it. It's just proximity, and then it seems like the same things kind of happen in proximity all the time, but we don't actually see the causation. If one billiard ball hits another billiard ball, you know, we see one moving, we see it stop, we see another start. We can make some generalizations about the description of, you know, how that tends to happen, and so it seems like we can come up with uh, these inductive, descriptive, you could call them laws, but there's nothing necessary about them. It's just contiguity, right? Well, I, I mean, Hume says explicitly, this is like memory and experience. He says, every day of your life, you've woken up, the sun has risen. So you expect that tomorrow when you wake up, the sun's going to rise too. That is in no way, shape or form necessary. It's just your blind faith based on what has happened in yep. the past. And the billiard balls fall in the same category. Yeah, you've seen it happen before. Yeah. And that leads to people doing psychological experiments with babies and <laughs> crashing billiard balls into them. <laughs> exactly. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Somebody like did a billiard ball experiment with babies and decided that at a certain age, the babies start to cry when you run the ball into another and they both just stop instead of seeing the motion that's supposed to be there. And they, so they said something like at six months, that's when the human beings get the concept of causality huh. because these babies started crying when the ball didn't All right. go straight. Actually, that does sound familiar now when you started describing them like what they put the babies on the table and they, they <laughs> hit them with billiard balls. That's what I thought you were talking that is, about. That is not nice. No, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this was an experiment that somebody did to try to yep. show – when people develop the idea of causality, which was the biggest load of hokum I've ever heard. <laughs> One way of explaining this Humean point is to say that we may have perceptions of color. There's a physical organ which helps us have sensations of color, but there's no organ which sort of takes in causality on the whole out of the world. This is, again, the problem of form. There's no organ of intuition that sucks in the form from the world. The form is sort of something that we have to, we might say, mentally construct. So all you get are these sequences of sensations, or, you know, Mark was talking about contiguity and so on and so forth, and to make sense of them by talking about causality is not to talk about anything that you could say corresponds to an object in the world, and therefore, you know, again, you get this sense that it's meaningless. So for Kant, he wants to get back causality, and the only way he can do that is to say that it's a category of the mind which the world already includes, where you reconceptualize the world as something that is already has the mental activity baked into it. So the world outside of that is this unavailable thing in itself, where all those categories of space and time they're no longer legitimate, and then the world that the mind stamps with its own categories, it stamps with space and time and causality and all those things, so that sort of by sucking all those things into the mind, you get this idea of objectivity, 
where the mind constructs it or bakes in those categories into the world to begin with. And then objectivity is a matter of analyzing or taking that synthesis and undoing it in the right way, in a way that's not in error. So we cannot help but see things as causal just as we can't help but seeing things as spatial. Right. It's objective in the sense that because the mind is constructed that way, it's never going to be the case that we're going to wake up and the sun hasn't risen or that a billiard ball hits another one and it doesn't move. Well, that it hasn't risen without a contravening cause. Of course, right. the sun I know, rise. I, know. It gets I mean, that's, up. that's yes. implied in what, <laughs> that's implied in all that. But um, you know what I'm saying. It's the idea that the nature of the mind grounds all of this stuff so that we can talk about, let's say, inner subjectivity. And there's an idea of objectivity based on the nature of the mind as opposed to simply the nature of the world. The nature of the mind grounds the thing which Hume says the world couldn't ground. Okay, so I'm pretty familiar with that from Kant. Let's turn back to Wittgenstein, because there's certain things he says that sound kind of like that, and there's certain things he said that don't sound like that at all. So, for instance, time and space, he says explicitly this is uh, 6.3611. He says, uh, we cannot compare any process with the passage of time, in quotes. There's no such thing, but only with another process, say with the movement of a chronometer. Hence, the description of temporal sequence of events is only possible if we support ourselves on another process. It is exactly analogous for space, when, for example, we say that neither of two events, which mutually exclude one another, can occur, because there is no cause why one should occur rather than the other. It is really a matter of our being unable to describe one of the two events, unless there is some sort of asymmetry. And if there is such an asymmetry, we can regard this as the cause of the occurrence of the one and the non-occurrence of the other. So... I understand less the way he's describing it in terms of space than I do in terms of, of time, that he's certainly not saying that we have this mental apparatus that imposes temporality on our experience. He seems to be saying that time and space are illusions. There's only relations between particular things. There's not atoms in the void because there's no void that we can make any sense of. And I think... It's even stronger than that. It's that those relations are all logical. Yep. So do you buy that? Do you even know how to take that? I don't know how you reduce physics to logic. He says in uh, 6.34, he says, All propositions such as the law of causation, the law of continuity in nature, the law of least expenditure in nature, etc., all these are a priori intuitions of possible forms of the propositions of science, which whatever that means. Uh. And then he, but he, ex he actually explains himself. Newtonian mechanics, for example brings the description of the universe to a unified form. Let us imagine a white surface with irregular black spots. We now say, whatever kind of picture these make, I can always get as near as I like to its description if I cover the surface with a sufficiently fine square network and now say of every square if it is white or black. In this way, I shall have brought the description of the surface to a unified form. This form is arbitrary because I could have applied with equal success a triangular or hexagonal mesh. It can happen that the description would have been simpler with the aid of a triangular mesh that is to say, we might have described the surface more accurately with a triangular and coarser than with a finer mesh or vice versa, and so on. So the different networks correspond to different systems describing the world. Normally he doesn't allow, as we were saying before, you to make any universal claims at all. So what the scientific theories are really saying, these general theories like of causality, are kind of mechanical axioms, he says. It provides the bricks for the building of the edifice of science. He's trying to figure out a framework that will imply all the different contingent atomic facts. So by saying everything is causal, it's not actually making concrete predictions. It's like a form of trying to understand the world. Well, I want to say there's a little point earlier than that, Mark. He says, here we go with the numbers, 6.234, mathematics is a method of logic. And he goes on and talks about equations for a little while. And he says, 6.32, the law of causality is not a law, but the form of a law. Mm. The law of causality, that is a general name. And just as in mechanics, for example, there are minimum principles such as the law of least action, so too in physics there are causal laws, laws of the causal form. All such propositions, including the principle of sufficient reason. The law of continuity in nature. <laughs> Yeah, all of these are a priori insights about the forms in which the propositions of science can be cast. So to go back to the example you said before, imagine a white field with black spots on it. 
and I overlay a grid onto that that's made of squares. And I say, see, this is the structure of the black spots on the white field. And he says, well, you know what, though? Instead of doing squares, I could do triangles or rectangles or circles, right? That grid that you overlay that gives some kind of quote-unquote structure and explains, that's his analogy for what, like, the law of causality or the general law as laws of physics. They're a system that is used to make sense of or order the propositions about the world. Not the world, not the actual states of affairs, because further down, he says, 6.4, the sense of the world must lie outside of the world. In the world, everything is as it is, and everything happens as it does happen, and in it, no value exists. If there's any value that does have value, it must lie outside the whole sphere of what happens and is the case, because all that happens and all that is the case is accidental, and what makes it non-accidental cannot lie within the world. Yep. Okay. So basically what he's saying is the world just simply is this crazy collection of states of affairs that are completely accidental. There are logical possibilities that create states of affairs, and that's what's out there. Then there are propositions or thoughts or whatever you want to call it, just the facts. Okay, the facts about the world. That's, that's the facts being the true, facts. And yep. true, true or false, right? So the facts have the sense. The facts have values. The world does not. So all these propositions of science and logic are just ways that we use to order facts to give ourselves some sort of psychological comfort that there is order <laughs> out of chaos. But the reality is we're not talking about the world. We're talking about the way that we talk about the world. When you say there's such a thing as causality, you're making a statement about the way that we think about the world, not about the way the world is, because it's completely accidental. Yep. Wow. Well, and he doesn't give an analysis of this epistemologically he doesn't say like Kant does that we just you know perceive it as causal it's that when we form propositions about it is that is that what he's saying he's just giving the same thing but giving it in linguistic terms yeah i think so mm, i don't know well i think it is like Wes the linguistic is the, is the better Kant version of Kant. or that's i maybe i try and see everything through the lens of Kant, we, we, i mean that's what this sounds like but when we form propositions about Things happening, they inevitably come out causal. <laughs> okay, so I think what Kant says is, uh, I don't want to be that bold as to say what Kant says, but... An interpretation of Kant might be... An interpretation of Kant might be that Kant says the way that we experience reality, we impose a structure of causality on it, and we can't really do otherwise. Now, that may or may not be like maybe beings from another planet would not have a different notion that wouldn't imply causality or what have you. But Kant is literally saying experience and reality has the structure of causality because we put that structure but on it. But by the way, just the, the beings from another planet would have it as well because he thinks he derives it from the nature of experience as such. It's not just okay. causality is accidental. Causality is analytically implied by the word experience. Yeah. That's great, which I think draws a, a stronger contrast to Wittgenstein, who's basically saying reality, and he, you notice he never uses the term reality. He uses the term the world, right? There is no causality in the world. Causality is a empty, logical construct that we use to order our thoughts or facts about the world, because to not do so would presumably be somehow chaotic and less attractive. But I think he's making a clear and explicit distinction and saying the world itself does not have any cause. It's completely accidental. Which you would have to say about the Kantian ding on seek. It sounds like he's in the ding on seek realm, except there, there's logic there. There's um thing in itself. Yeah, sorry, the thing in itself. You know, it's similar to Hume and Kant in the sense that causality isn't out there in the world for Kant in the sense of the in the world of the ding on Zeke, for the objective world or our world of scientific experience, Kant had a very special idea of that, where there was such a thing as causality, again, grounded in the nature of the mind. I think, Mark, what you're saying is a good contrast, that Kant could ground that in the mind, and Wittgenstein doesn't seem to be saying why it is that causality would be a form of language. It seemed like he was just saying that it's a convenient way for us to 
organize atomic facts, in other words, to derive them from each other, that we, if we set up some of these basic, what sound like mechanical axioms, then we can deduce a lot of stuff from them. And if the things that we can deduce from them happen to correspond with actual facts in the world, then we say, oh, this causality thing seems to work out pretty well, right? But well, it's not that causality is no. in the world. It's just that if we assume causality and we serve some facts like that, you know, one billiard ball is on its way to hit another one. And then we look and see, you know, what that predicts. Oh, and it just happens to come true. That is really contingent matter as far as anything we could know anything about. But we can make these assumptions just to try to organize. As long as we understand that that's what we're doing. It's just a shorthand to try to get from some facts to other facts. Then uh, we can still use that in science as we have been all along. I think that's a good reading of it, Mark. That if you literally had to go and discover all the individual atomic facts... I'm trying to think of something that would be useful. Like it would be impossible to build a house if you weren't able to create some kind of more general proposition that you yep. would call a law right? out of the facts that you've experienced and seen that's a, that's a so great that example. you could predict what kind of behavior you could expect in the future. If you did X and Y, you would expect the outcome Z. And the only way you can do that is if you do have some kind of construct that makes the thoughts coherent and you have some idea of causality, consistency, and some kind of law that's going to hold across of those things. But that doesn't mean there are those laws out there. That's still just a logical construct that helps you order your thoughts. Yep. That's very good. But that suggests that we, we, we don't have the choice of seeing the world non-causally. That's the problem here that I'm having. It's not just a pragmatic maxim that we could we adhere have to or not adhere to. Right. He's, he is just saying causality itself is a priori intuition of the possible forms of the property of science. So... It's not causality itself that we could vary, but it seems like the general laws, different systems of physics, for instance, like sort of as long as they all work, like Newton's physics and Einstein's physics. Yeah, I think he's trying to say causality is logically related to this whole system of possibilities of related atomic facts. In other words, it's a logical principle as opposed to a physical principle, ultimately. It's not a... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's not about states of affairs. It's about propositions about states yep. of affairs. It's like there a layer. Go. All of these things are layered on top yeah. of propositions. But the logic is still, it's not something we make a choice about. There's a sort of substance at the bottom of things, which is determining all these logical properties and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, I've been trying to think of an example. So let's say you had a proposition. The proposition said, a feather and a stick of the same size. This stick is heavier than this feather. And they're the same size. Sure. Right. And you were trying to get to a statement that said, if you have a stick and a feather, and if they are both the same size, the stick will be heavier. So you're saying something about density or mass or what have you. All you can do from a propositional perspective is say, this stick is heavier than this feather. This stick is heavier than this feather. This stick is heavier than this feather. And they're the same size, right? And they're the same size, blah, blah, blah. In order to get to... Any stick that is the same size as any feather, the stick will be heavier, requires that you, and this is, goes back to Mark's talk at the beginning of the last episode about universals, right? Or claims about all this or every this or some of these. That's essentially what all the truth functional tables and what all these laws of logic and laws of mechanics, <laughs> quote, and, he, and he puts law of causality or law of mechanics in quotes, right? Because really what he's trying to say is to say that that's the case, which sounds like a law of physics, because your next step up is going to be something like sticks are more dense than feathers, and density is a measure of mass in space, and so on and so forth. What Wittgenstein is saying is, really, all you're doing is some sort of trick with truth functionality and logic, even though it sounds like science, it sounds like mechanics. Yeah, I, I think a way of getting at that is to say, well, why ask a question keep going down the chain of causality and say, what's the foundation for mass here? And you could say, well, it's this number of electrons around the atom and blah, blah, blah. And you keep going until you get to, let's say, these basic facts of physics, which no longer have causes. And I think this is a candidate for atomic facts, by the way. And then there's no causal relation between these propositions. So all you get is... The, What's the basic? You get on top Sorry, of them. Well, I don't know what it would be. It would be, let's say, you know, here's a quark, and this is what happens when you put two quarks together. But then you can't say, well, why that? What's the structure of the quark? That, you know, supposing that the quark is the ultimate 
particle. You no longer can ask that question why. Causality is no longer relevant here. You just have a, a bunch of bare assertions about the world, right? It's just going to be the case that the quark behaves this way, and then the rest of it is built up on that foundation. You know, I think that's what he means by accidents. I think it's just these are like commandments, and there is no reason for them. They just are. And then what's built out of them is no longer causal, then they're all truth functionally related to the other propositions. We should talk a little more about the truth functionality, because this is about half of the Tractatus is talking about that the fundamental relationship between propositions is that they're truth functional of each other. Right, He says all propositions are the result of truth operations on the elementary proposition. So you could take the statement A or B, and the way you define or is to say, if A or B is true, then you can make a table where there's true for A and true for B, or true for A and false for B, and so on and so forth, where you get this whole system of possibilities where one side of the possibilities adds up to the statement being true, and the other... Where say right, the A, compound A yep. is false and B is false. The compounds are built up out of these relationships to the truth values of P and Q. P or Q has its own truth value, true or false, and then that depends in some logical way on the truth of P and the truth of Q. Right, and by defining all these signs in terms of truth tables, what he's really saying is that it's the truth tables, that process that is basic, the signs themselves are not basic. You could define whatever signs you want. You could just take any random like configuration on truth tables and say, oh, this is the definition of the or sign, or make up your own signs. And so that was you know, fairly revolutionary. And it, it was also to say, for instance, he said that because not not P and P say the same thing, that proves that those are just the same proposition. Then, in other words, you could have really complicated looking things in logic that if that has the same truth table values as a very simple one, then you say, actually, those mean the same thing, right? If they're logically equivalent, he says, signs which serve uh, one purpose are logically equivalent. Signs which serve no purpose are logically meaningless. So he applies that to math. Seth, you mentioned earlier that he does a logicization of math, and he was not the first one to do this, and he was just sort of giving his version of it. But it was a way to say, it's not that math is like that we have this empirical experience of one and two and three, and then we extrapolate from that to and so on. It's that he creates this uh, truth table definition of the various mathematical signs, right? Of number itself, the concept of number. So whereas somebody might say, you know, it's knowledge we have before birth to say two plus two equals four, or all these mathematical things, we must be remembering something. What he's saying is, no, no, really numbers are all introduced in one concept, so all mathematical truths are true by definition. They're not really, a lot of other philosophers had used this, like Plato had used this to say, you know, something significant about this a priori knowledge that we have. And he's saying, no, 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 it's all just true by definition. It's a fact about the logic itself, about the language of numbers that you've created itself, which is all ultimately reducible to, you know, this truth table uh, analysis. Okay, I get what you're saying. I mean, I think I followed that. I got a different sort of read off of the truth table discussion that, that goes something like this. The significance of talking about truth functions is that a truth function gets its truth value from the truth and falsity of the propositions that are in it. Yep. A proposition gets its truth value by whether or not it pictures a state of affairs in the world. Well, an atomic proposition. For, yeah, for, uh, only in, an, only in atomic. Uh, okay, well, I was trying to avoid using that term, <laughs> but I'm glad both of you jumped on me. Because it sounds to me like if you can form a proposition that our criteria for what constitutes an atomic proposition is, it gets its truth value from the world. Yep. And if you get your truth value from anything other than a direct state of affairs in the world... You're a truth function. Mm -hmm. But the atomic proposition, by the way, just to clarify, it gets its truth value from sharing the logical yeah, form. Yeah, I was state about of to say that. World. Yeah. yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's just that picture. Yeah, the picturing thing so, we just talked about last. Yeah, time. yeah. So the significance of sort of reducing everything to logic and reducing everything to truth functionality is basically to say that. Because number theory or mathematics does not get its truth function because it shares a logical form with a state of affairs in the world, mm -hmm. it gets its truth function 
based on the truth or falsity of components somehow. It can be analyzed. Does, and, does that yeah. Does that even make sense? Yeah, well, arithmetic can be derived from logic. You can so look it's up all, pianos, it's all axioms, and... trivially true. It's not you know, a discovery of any sort. It's not a remembered from a previous life discovery. It's just trivially true. It's true by definition. Well, it's like but you could say that you could just, to give the defense of the a prioriist, you could just push that back onto the logic. You could say the logic is the a priori. Th I mean, you know, the alternative, I think, is a legitimate possibility as well, which is to say this is just the feature of the language that's being used. I think it becomes an epistemological question, like what's in the brain to begin with and so on and so forth. I don't well, know. anyways, so he gets, he gets this whole basic, then he moves on to some kind of weirder area. So to understand, uh, you know, these inductive principles that make up science, to prepare for that, he talks about probability and he gives this very weird, you know, we have all these mathematical models of probability, but he says... This is a 5.153. A proposition is in itself neither probable nor improbable. An event occurs or it does not occur. There is no middle course. And he gives it a definition of probability just based on truth grounds, which are features of these truth tables. So if you have a sentence A, and then you have a sentence A and B, and then A is true, you could say there's a 50% chance that the compound A and B is true, right? Because they share a certain number of rows in the truth table. So that's a very weird definition of probability. Yeah. It doesn't seem to capture what science would want out of that at all. Oh, definitely not. Science wants the laws to be able to describe behaviors in the world, or even using Wittgensteinian terms. You want to be able to predict the truth value of a proposition using a scientific law. Whereas I think what Wittgenstein is saying is you can predict the truth value of the law as it's applied to the proposition, but not about the proposition itself. Probability is a weird case, though, isn't it? It can either be a matter of our ignorance about more fundamental laws, or it has to be a matter of chance, right? I don't know about the probability discussion, yeah. I mean, to say that, say, well, there's a 50-50 chance of it raining tomorrow. There's two possible explanations for that prob right, we just probabilistic assertion. One of them is that if we had all the facts, we would be able to say for certain whether it's going to rain. And the other is that at bottom, there's basic randomness in the universe. So even if we had all the facts, we wouldn't be able to say. But yet he wants to give free reign to science to do what it does, which is... <laughs> make generalizations about the present, which then get confirmed or disconfirmed based on observations of events that were in the future when you were to say it in the first time. So you are making predictions about the future. And Carnap, you know, doesn't have a problem with that because he just says these are these are hypotheses, right? We won't for sure know that the key is iron, but as long as, you know, there are these verificational elements that can make us more and more and more sure, that's enough. It doesn't look like Wittgenstein is even giving us room for that, at least in this strict discussion of probability here. Let me try a weird metaphor. If we think of atomic facts as, say, colored particles, and say 90% of them are red and 10% are white, and they build up the world in a certain way, and then out of that you get certain patterns at the higher level, complex ones, which you could think of as aggregates in this metaphor, patterned aggregates. So there you could say, well, there's a probability because of the prevalence and the atomic level of the red particles or marbles, let's say, you're going to get a pattern which will produce those, those causal laws will flow from that, or even some probabilistic law, let's say, you know, like 90% of the stuff in the world's red, or I don't know. I'm trying to think about it in a visual way in order to make sense of the building up from the atomic facts to what things look like scientifically. Let's turn back to the text. 6.3, going from the probability discussion, he says, Logical research means the investigation of all regularity, and outside logic, all is accident. So if you're going to be doing scientific lawmaking that involves talking about probability in the way we think that you know, talking about induction does, then you're doing logic. So high-level science right. has to be logic, which makes sense because he says that, strictly speaking, when you're talking about the world, if you make a general statement, what you're just making is a bunch of statements about individuals. So... If you say all cows have two stomachs or something, it's really you're implicitly just saying that about all of the existent cows now. You're not talking about all cows in the future, all possible cows, something like that. That just doesn't even make sense. 
You have to be actually describing things in the world now, so even future tense doesn't make any sense, strictly speaking. Mm. So if you're doing that, and it does make sense, you must be talking about logic. You must be talking about this language itself. So this is also atemporal, this fact world. Time is built up out of it. Well, let me just rephrase, I think, what you were saying, Mark. Go ahead. So to take the law law of gravitation, there's no entity out there, gravity. If you were to reduce the facts of what's going on between objects gravitationally to the atomic facts, you would see that what we see as a physical law, a matter of physical necessity, is actually just analytic. It just flows logically from the atomic facts, right? Hey, can I take another step? Go ahead. I, I just, Wes, you just made me think of something. So the law of gravity is a great example because it sounds like what Wittgenstein is saying is that you can measure a state of affairs and see that an object falls to the ground or whatever. You can measure gravity in a particular state of affairs. So there's a state of affairs that's a specific instance of gravitational pull that shares a logical form with the world, and it becomes true. And you do that a number of times in a number of different contexts, and then you say, wow, across all of these states of affairs that share a logical form with the world and are true, there is this commonality from which I create this law called gravity. But the truth of the law of gravity is related to the truth function of those specific propositions about the state of affairs. The law of gravity itself does not share any logical form with the world such that you could just say the law of gravity is true in the same way that a proposition shares that form. So kind of what he's saying is, by virtue of the way I have defined all this stuff, any law, it has no logical form that it shares with the world. It's just simply a logical proposition in the same way that modus ponens is a logical proposition, but it does not, there's no modus ponens logical form in the world. Yep. Yeah, I I think that goes for any compound propositions. Yeah, I think it would hold for any compound propositions, but... It's once you get to the... That to me explains to me why he thinks that there is no gravity in the world per se. Yeah. He's just saying the law of gravity as a proposition does not correspond in any way with logical form to the world. Here's a quote from uh, the latter part of 6.342. So, too, the fact that the world can be described by Newtonian mechanics asserts nothing about the world. But this asserts something, namely that it can be described in a particular way in which, as a matter of fact, it is described. (laughs) That was meant to be illuminating. (laughs) It's crazy. Well, if you go along with this, it makes it interesting how science would be achieved because... In some sense, he's kind of foreshadowing what happens in the 20th century when, like, all physics becomes mathematics, and you just start creating all of these compound propositions, and then you run out of facts, and you're sort of just relating compound propositions to each other, and then you're like, oh, you know what? I need to find the facts that justify this, so I need to build a giant super collider, because I've kind of run out of, you know, we've determined all the facts Mm -hmm. in Newtonian space, and now we have to kind of go to this different level. And I'm able to meaningfully create all these compound propositions of science, but the truth or non-truth of them is going to be dependent upon these atomic facts that I need to go out and find. The law of gravitation kind of a f- holds between propositions, in a sense, not between facts. Yeah, the facts don't have laws that govern them, per se. Yeah, right. They make laws true, but yeah. laws are just propositions, too, and all propositions are independent so of there's each no, other. So there's no fact out there corresponding... To the law of gravitation, it is a relationship between propositions, which, if we analyze them enough, we would get to atomic facts, which in fact do correspond to something in the world. But at the level of gravity, it's just this logical relationship between a bunch of propositions. Which is not a very scientifically friendly, you know, a, a yeah. conception that is very friendly to the practice of science. So you can see when the logical positivists tried to take it seriously as a way of supporting science through philosophy, like apparently that's why the verification was eventually abandoned. It was because the verificationists really wanted to have even these general, right? They weren't just treating general terms as logical sentences. They were treating them as inductive generalizations, like scientists usually suppose them, not doing something radical with them 
like uh, Wittgenstein was. And uh, it turned out that they had a hard time applying this verificationist principle, which says that all these very system-wide, you know, really high-level abstract laws of physics and things, at one point there was a move to, well, it's not that every single law, you know, has a particular set of perceptions associated with it. It's the system as a whole has a set of perceptions associated with it. And it, it became such that they couldn't define exactly what counts as real verification so that it would rule out the metaphysics that they wanted to rule out, but it would allow the very abstract high-level scientific talk that mm. scientists were actually engaged in. And that was ultimately like the collapse of the whole thing. Interesting. Yeah, I find this kind of funny because I can kind of imagine if you look at 6.343, Three, he says, mechanics is an attempt to construct, according to a single plan, all the true propositions that we need for the description of the world. The laws of physics, with all their logical apparatus, still speak, however indirectly, about objects in the world. We ought not to forget that any description of the world by means of mechanics will be of the completely general kind. For example, it will never mention particular point masses. It will only talk about any point mass whatsoever. So I had this image in my head of... Some scientists saying, oh, well, here's the scientific law. What is it? Uh, force equals mass times velocity. Is that true? Is that one? Yeah. Okay. So force equals mass times velocity. And Wittgenstein says, wow, that's great. Prove it. And the guy goes, okay, here's some more math that shows that the equation is valid. And he's like, mm, so what you did was you just showed that it's consistent with the series of signs that's consistent that something over here. And the guy's like, hmm, yeah, you're right. Well, here, here's how I'll prove it. Here's a mass, and I'm going to throw it, and I'm going to measure what happens, and then I'm going to throw another mass at a different speed, and then I'm going to throw a different mass at a different speed, and then once I get all these things together, I'll be able to, to show you that the math works out. And so Wittgenstein says, oh, so force equals mass times velocity. What you're really saying is this particular mass thrown at this velocity equals this force. And so that one thrown at that velocity equals that force. That, that's really what it, this comes down to. Yeah. You just found a shorthand way to say that. Or in other words, the law is directed towards the propositions rather than towards the world. So that when you say F equals MV, it's not a description of the world in the sense of about the facts corresponding to the propositions. It's so the facts about this when you threw this mass and this is what happened. Rather... You take all those little separate events, you threw the mass and this is what happened, you threw the mass and this is what happened, you take that series of propositions, and then F equals MV is in a sense about those propositions. And what's interesting about that is you can see how, A, it's not very science friendly, because basically Wittgenstein's saying, yeah. anytime, always, if you want to speak meaningfully about a scientific law or, or whatever, you're going to end up having to prove it with a specific example. Yeah, But it also shows why Carnap and those guys picked up on it as verificationism, is that everything's going to have to be reducible to something you can actually show and point at. I, I love the poetic justice of this, where it starts to <laughs> devour itself. You know, and it's, it's the Hume-Kant problem all over again, because Kant comes along and starts worrying that Hume's skepticism concerning causality makes even science something that's not objective and... That can't be. So it's sort of like a repetition of that. You know, once you come along and you're anti-metaphysical, it's a slippery slope to being anti-science. I find that very interesting. Yeah, and so this is why he makes a little nod to Hume in this. I don't know if you caught that in um, 6.36311. You guys <laughs> read this a lot more carefully than I did. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. He says, um, it's a hypothesis that the sun will rise tomorrow. And this means that we do not know whether it will rise. Because just before and after this, he talks about induction being a psychological need, the law of induction. So if you figure out all the physics and the physical laws that arise from the propositions about the physical facts that, that tell you that the earth spins around the sun and yada, 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 right? So you basically say the earth is a mass that revolves around the sun and rotates on its axis and you know you have all these laws that describe that and then you say therefore the sun will rise tomorrow you're essentially doing kind of a deductive maneuver because of what we just talked about which is to say that the fact of the earth spinning and all this stuff is completely independent from it having done it two days ago and doing it two days mm -hmm. from now and that you just have this apparatus to describe it what he says is what you're really doing 
you can't ever deduce from a physical law of nature something is going to happen. You induce. Is that the right word? Yeah. He's like, you do it because you have the psychological need to believe that it's going to happen because there's no such thing as physical necessity. Uh, the states of affairs are accidental. There's only logical necessity. And, and so logical, it's, that's yeah. totally human. Totally. And he's even using the sun rising, which is the human example. Now, if it turns out that's awesome. that in the whole set of atomic facts that the sun always does rise, you know, all things being equal, we're, we're ruling out any of the cases where the sun gets blown up and all that stuff. If you looked at the whole field of facts and everything was such that that supposition about the sun flowed logically from all the atomic facts, there's your logical necessity. But the problem is that at this point in time, we can't know that whole field of facts. It could still be a law, which, again, it's the law is directed towards the propositions. It's about the propositions. But if you take right. the whole set of propositions, and it is the case that every proposition is in accord with the sun always rising, then that law, in a sense, holds. Because there is, again, there's no physical necessity that it's that way. You could have been in a world where gravity held every time but once. There's just for a split second, gravity was gone, and the world behaved completely bizarrely against the law of physics. There's no logical inconsistency to that. So if you took the whole set of propositions, you'd see that little errant group of propositions that didn't fit the overall pattern. Yeah, I actually suddenly am a lot warmer to Wittgenstein because I, I have been, I've been kind of a Humean for a long time where, you know, I bought the idea that it's my experience of things happening over and over again that makes me expect that they will happen again. Mm -hmm. The fact that something happens over and over and over in my past experience makes me think it will happen again. And that I used to get very passionate about the idea that I couldn't care less about the laws of physics when it comes to me wondering whether or not the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Like no amount of physics explained to me, no symbols on paper, no telling me about gravity and all that stuff was ever going to convince me. You know, that had no bearing on it. It was all about my experience of the way the world worked. And Wittgenstein has just given me a really elegant way of like telling you that your laws of physics really don't do much for me deductively, that the best I can do is inductively reason to future events. It's a very clever and elegant way of pointing out the limits as well of science. You know, I started off, I think about 30 minutes ago, I was talking about generating these general laws in order to be able to predict behavior that you couldn't theoretically mm -hmm. do things like build buildings without, you know, having laws of engineering and mechanics. So the laws themselves describe the behavior. It gives you the structure, but you still have to essentially inductively assume that the materials you're working with are going to behave as if they did in the past. So there's like this combination of faith and reason. And what's, or, what's interesting... Sorry, experience and logic. So your experience helps you generate the logic which sets your expectations for the future, but there's still... It's your experience that has to generate your assumption that you will actually get what you expect. Yeah. And the good news is that happens enough of the time that you don't have to worry about it, but only with, like, rocks and stones and concrete. <laughs> not with people. And it preserves... But it still preserves necessity, too. It's not just this kind of skepticism that gets rid of necessity entirely, which is an amazing thing. Yeah, it's a good point. This is the first time I've thought about the science part of it. It's an amazing thing he does. Whether it holds or not is another thing, but if the attempt to reduce to logic... It... Let me give a quote to cap it off. 6.371 At the basis of the whole modern view of the world lies the illusion that the so-called laws of nature are the explanations of natural phenomena. So people stop short at natural laws as something unassailable, as did the ancients at God and fate. And they both are right and wrong. But the ancients were clear insofar as they recognized one clear terminus, whereas the modern system makes it appear as though everything were explained. I guess I've always thought of scientific laws as just ways of ordering things that we think. It's not like when we're taught these things in the first place, it makes it seem like the law is actually causing things to happen. Like as if the right. Newton's laws are making this happen, like, <laughs> which is totally mysterious. <laughs> right. <laughs> how could a law possibly come out of the sky and, and cause this to happen? Or how did the law get the way it is in the first place? It is unexplained. Oh, because it, it's the most simple law, and God likes simplicity. Like it, it has... <laughs> Speaking of God, this reminds me of the whole debate about whether God does everything by fiat or if he's bound by, let's say, the rules, you know, the rules of the universe, which are prior to him. 
what Wittgenstein is doing is saying that these facts are in a way just there, you know, when he says they're, they're all contingent, they're just there by fiat, all those facts, and then rules flow out of those in the same way that they might flow out of God's arbitrary commandment. Well, it certainly would be interesting to read a Wittgensteinian who buys you know, this general viewpoint but still is willing to talk about ancient metaphysical questions like, can God lift a stone heavier than... <laughs> Can, heavier than God can lift. What? <laughs> but I still, I still see him as a metaphysician, you know, talking about substance and all that stuff. This is an ontology. You know, what's interesting, too, about this now, guys, is now that we've really hammered this down and you have this really, really kind of strict understanding of state of affairs, proposition, logical form, truth value, complex proposition, you know, truth value above that, right? Now, when I'm, I'm reading through what starts on 6.42, so too is it impossible for there to be propositions of ethics. Propositions can express nothing that is higher. It is clear that ethics cannot be put into words. Ethics is transcendental. Ethics and aesthetics are one and the same. Wow. That's a very humane point, too, aesthetics and, and ethics. But... Yeah, I think that's amazing and poetic. Yeah. But I think this is where people then say, did he just create space for kind of another category outside of logic that's called the transcendental? Yeah. That is outside of logical possibility and impossibility? Right, because it's those just, categories it, do not apply to the kind of thing you're talking about. <laughs> that's, that's what you mean by outside. Here's another way of putting well, it. I, no, no, no. If there are all oh, these things that are shown in the world but are not facts, you know, whether they are the logic or even some of these metaphysical, essentially metaphysical ruminations in the Tractatus, if you're talking about language or about something which is not of the world, you can include among those things, things like soul and God and so on and so forth. It makes room for it in that sense, I think. If you take the meaninglessness or the nonsense thing as non-pejorative, which it I'm looks, content to. Right, that's a reading that you could run with. I think as far as what he thinks about it, you know, if you're looking at 6.5, say, you know, if a question can be put at all, then it can also be answered. A question can only exist where there is an answer, and this is only where something can be said. And we've already, you know, talked about what can be said or not. You know, he, he really seems to come down. It's not just, oh, but we can only have certain of knowledge of things of this. The way he ends it, right? Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. In other words, I'm not saying like Kant is, that, oh, you now have free reign to talk about faith, maybe that it's on one interpretation of Kant. You know, we understand that scientific knowledge doesn't apply to these transcendental things, so you can then speculate all you want as long as you know that you're just speculating or your actions are connected to these transcendental things by practical reason or these other mechanisms that Kant has of, of showing that ethical truths are the case we're talking about that in a couple episodes from here. But it just seems he wants to just shut it down, Wittgenstein. Well, it's, it's easy to say no, that no, after you've had... I don't think that's... And it's easy to say that after you've had your fun. It's like the girl who uh, becomes puritanical late in life after she's uh, had her fun early on. Where's the fun for everyone else, right? Tre I, Wittgenstein I don't can do a whole treatise talking about things which are essentially... He's talking about what's shown. He's not talking about... I mean, what proposition in the Tractatus is empirical? There's, there's nothing. It's all metaphysics. Well, it's all illegitimate in some sense. Except for maybe truth tables and the strictly logical stuff. But the rest of it is strictly speaking nonsense. So See, like Russell in the intro and Carnap in talking about this seem to think that why can't you have a second order language to talk about what your language can and can't do? So Carnap says that he doesn't really think a lot of the stuff that, according to Wittgenstein's strict definition, is senseless, really are senseless. That even as you say, if everything in the Tractatus is really off limits or everything is not pure logic, then this discussion of, you know, there's some illegitimate talk and there's some legitimate talk is itself illegitimate because you can't get on both sides of the limit to talk about where the limit is. Like it just shows itself is the way he puts it. And Carnap just denies that. Of course it makes sense. You understand it perfectly well. And it makes sense in a way that you know, everything is water or there is a God or there is not a God or everything is ideas or everything is matter in which those don't make sense. I really do see those as you can still think that a lot of the stuff Wittgenstein says in here is has sense, but, it's, but yet still rule out 
metaphysics proper. Well, it's senseless, but not nonsense. But it's senseless in the strict sense of the logical tautologies being, you know, senseless. But it still is, that's a technical meaning of senseless. But yeah, I think you could say all that stuff is not nonsense. But, you know, when he starts talking about the world as being composed of facts, he's no longer just talking about language. And that's where he gets into, I don't, I don't see how Carnap could say that that's not metaphysics. Yeah, that yeah, that part in point. particular. I agree with that. That part in particular, that. that talking about particulars and stuff in the way we were in the whole first episode here. I mean, I think there's a reason why, at least in this bit. I, I don't know how much Carnap or other folks talk about that in other contexts. But the problem is, you know, they deprive themselves of the ability to, again, I hate to harp on this, but I just don't know how you justify a verificationist principle according to the verificationist premise. You can't say verificationism holds because of something I observed in the world. No, that's true. You could never prove verificationism. Or even inductively prove it. Deductively or inductively. Yeah, it would have to be the truth functionality of verificationism would depend upon a bunch of facts. Right, well, all, all of them... A bunch and of I, propositions. You know, I, I don't, since we just read this little piece of Carnap, I don't know that we should... He probably has a response to this. I know, yeah, I know Russell sure himself says in the Logical Atomism piece that the postulate that there are multiple things in the world, he says, is ultimately undefended. Like, he admits that there are certain things that you start with, and you can sort of, as you work out the things that follow from that, you can sort of see, okay, that makes more and more sense, but you can't ultimately go back and give a proof for it. And I think that's the way verificationism is itself supposed to show up. It's just, it's we understand how language works. We understand Hume's point about the connection between legitimate language and perception. And so it's just trying to go with that intuition. And you can say, it's not that you can prove it by induction, but you can show cases where clearly someone does not know what he's talking about because he's talking about things that have no relationship at all to any, right? You can pick up paradigm cases of nonsense of this sort and paradigm cases, on the other hand, of things that very clearly have a verificationist basis, have a basis in perception, and say, look how much clearer that thing is than these wacky discussions of how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that I'm now completely distracted? Now that all the work that we did today and the last time, which I think, you know, whatever the listener may feel or whatever you guys may feel, I think has greatly elucidated my understanding of this and given me a much greater appreciation Same. for somebody who I used to just be very dismissive and angry about. I used about. to think he was a fraud. I was <laughs> pretty close to that myself. I'm motivated right now to just spend a good portion of time on just the 6.4 section. Now that I kind of understand... I don't want to say that. Now that I have an interpretation of all the stuff that comes before, I'm really kind of interested to go and look at this stuff about ethics and, you know, the transcendental and so on. Because I, in the context now of what he's saying, it makes me think that he's created a space, a metaphysical space, if you will, for God, ethics, and all that. And I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. The mystical. I guess this is what people like me get fixated on in this text, though, because it's always yep. some clown like me that writes a book like Wittgenstein and the mystical. <laughs> you know, it's like it's somebody who studied Heidegger. <laughs> Should we throw out some random quotes from the 6.4 section to contemplate? So, for instance, 6.43, when he's just said, you know, ethical talk is off limits. If good or bad willing changes the world, it can only change the limits of the world, not the facts not the things that can be expressed in language. In brief, the world must thereby become quite another. It must, so to speak, wax or wane as a whole. The world of the happy is quite another than that of the unhappy. What do you make of that? <laughs> it makes me think of the whole mind-body thing again, the idea that the mental doesn't do anything within the world, right? You know, we talked about that with Leibniz, this conservation of mass and energy. So good or bad willing cannot change the world. It cannot alter the facts. And so when you say change the limits of the world... Well, well I'll tell you what, yeah. the interpretation... So I don't know which translation I'm looking at the you Ogden. have. Okay, the one that's on the Gutenberg, mm -hmm. this is the translation. So let me read the previous statement as well. It is impossible to speak about the will insofar as it is the subject of ethical attributes. And the will as a phenomenon is of interest only to psychology. 
If the good or bad exercise of the will does alter the world, it can alter only the limits of the world, not the facts, not what can be expressed by means of language. In short, the effect must be that it becomes an altogether different world. It must, so to speak, wax and wane as a whole. The world of the happy man is a different one from that of the unhappy man. So too, at death, the world does not alter, but comes to an end. See, now it makes me think of Sartre. You know, he talks about emotions coloring your world. This is part of why we have this ultimate freedom is because we have the power to interpret, maybe not just at will, but something within us can interpret our situation in different ways. So even if we're in chains, we can interpret it such that we can feel very free or feel not free or, you know, we can remake the world. So again, like the world of the happy is very different from the world of the unhappy. It sounds to me like he just created a demarcation between subjective experience of the world and what you might call objective experience of the world. So the facts are the basis that allow us to have a commonality, the world that we share, but anything that's not related to facts, psychological, the will, ethical, and all that defines my subjective experience of the world. And yeah, the subjective that's where the limits come in or the world as a whole. That's another thing in a way that's only shown but can't be said, right? You can't refer to the mind as an object. I think the the concept of trans... And I'm speculating wildly based on just a couple of sentences, but his concept of transcendence must be pretty rigorous because he's really talking about something that is above and separate from the facts of the world and yet at the same time is manifest in it or somehow arises. It's kind of difficult. Later on, just a few sentences later, he says, God does not reveal himself in the world. And we know that, you know, ethics is transcendent. And yet somehow they must be connected or related in some way, shape or form. I don't know. Just this last section is kind of interesting. 6.44. Oh, sorry. Yep. That's exactly where I was going. That's It I is not that. how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. Which, by the way, justifies my previous assertion that getting around the issue of existence and non-existence as being a pain in the ass. Well, here's another point in there, 6.4312. The temporal immortality of the soul, that is to say its eternal survival after death, is not only in no way guaranteed, but this assumption in the first place will not do for us what we always tried to make it do. Is a riddle ever solved by the fact that I survive forever? Is this eternal (laughs) life not as enigmatic as our present one? The solution of the riddle of life in space and time lies outside space and time. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's great. And here, if you tie these two things together, it is not how things are in the world that is mystical, but that it exists. Yep. And skip down. Skepticism is not irrefutable, but obviously nonsensical when it tries to raise doubts where no questions can be asked. For doubt can exist only where a question exists, a question only where an answer exists, and an answer only where something can be said. So the mystical fact of existence cannot be spoken sensibly about. So to be a skeptic is to be completely confused and just spout nonsense. See, I don't think nonsense is all confusion because I think... Sorry, it's nonsensical. Because you're based... Strictly speaking, 6.51 is also nonsensical. That's the irony of all this. Yes, that's true. (laughs) But, you know, but I still agree. It it is strictly speaking. Oh, he says senseless in this translation. Says nonsensical in mine. I should get the German, but. Because those are very, those mean two different things for him. How about this one? The next 6.52. We feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Of course, then there are no questions left. And this itself is the answer. (laughs) I'm a Buddhist, uh, man. I'm just going to become a Buddhist. Problem is clearly not a question to be answered. What is the sound of two hands clapping? One hand clapping. Why did I say two hands? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question with an answer. The same reason I asked earlier whether God could lift a stone heavier than he could lift. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's funnier that way. <laughs> So I've considered in the past, the very recent past, as a matter of fact, becoming one of those crazy cult leaders and retiring to a compound. And, do, you have the, you know, getting... do you have the charisma for that? I didn't say I'd be successful at it. <laughs> um, I just said I was considering it. Now, when you're starting with a cult, do you start with just like a couple people to test it out? Or is there like a, 
minimum number of people who's like peer pressure against each other, you know, creates the cult. So you need to start with a minimum of 10 in the first place. No, no, no. I think, I, I think you can start with even an individual following and you just sort of build it up and then it gets its critical mass. Cause you know, you could just have three or four disciples, you know, and they could convert other people or they could help you spread whatever it is your doctrine of. But if I don't turn the 6.4 section into some kind of poem that then I can <laughs> post on my wall here, I may use it as a basis for some kind of transformative religion, new religion. Yeah, what are we talking about? This podcast is the perfect method for uh, building a cult. <laughs> yeah, so Especially when we get into this I, mystical stuff. I don't know, but I can't be sharing power with you guys. If I form a cult, I'm going solo. <laughs> I'm sorry. How do you know we won't be your disciples? That's a good point. Mark clearly won't because he's already solved all those questions for himself. He doesn't need me to guide him. He's not a lost sheep. You need, some uh, we you need to find some weak-minded people. I'm pretty weak-minded. <laughs> I'm flexible because I, you know, I don't believe that the whole, you know, consistency is the the hobgoblin of uh, big old fat minds or whatever that is. You know, so I might have reached some conclusions, but the next day I'm like, oh, Seth wants me to be a slave. Eh, okay. <laughs> I just want to be accepted, even if it means being Seth's slave. <laughs> I think I'd be satisfied. Said about slavery. I, what what immediately made your mind go from well, cult to slavery? Well, that's that's where my mind was. Like, I, if I got three or four followers, like that's probably enough because then they could do my laundry. They could whatever needs doing. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, <laughs> I totally agree. I really don't think the need is great. I'm certainly not the kind of person that feels like I have to have a flock of millions. I think you know, I no, think though it's the, I'm no Southern Baptist preacher in Dallas. It's kind of like a small business that you might think like, oh, to do my small business, I just need a couple helpers to you know get this idea that I have that I service I provide myself. But then once you have those people, they're like, well, I could have you know have a larger infrastructure and do more stuff and do all. You'd have the same thing. So if I have my couple disciples, I'd be like, eh, is that enough people to sleep with? Eh, I could use a few more, you know. Exactly. I could, exactly. Maybe I could have some of them making babies that I could then train from birth, and then you know you just start thinking bigger and bigger. Exactly. Yes. But you don't end that's, it all with a suicide thing. That's just stupid. That's just wasteful. No, you need I totally to. Agree you need that. to sustain your cult. However, it should destruct somehow upon your death. Like Scientology, something went wrong with that. Yeah, well, that's why those things are so persona heavy, you know. And once the leader dies, it's always hard to hold those things together. As as I it's, think mine as would planned. somehow, maybe I could tie these three things together. I could do kind of the Wittgensteinian mystical, the book of the subgenius. Do you remember that from mm -hmm. Junior Bob Dobbs, the book of the subgenius from back in the eighties? And then also somehow golf and the four hour work week. Like if I can pull all those things together, I think I might be onto something. Nice. And I'm kind of excited about imposing some kind of clothing restriction that makes everybody, and that makes people wear like, uh, plaid, semi puritanical, very very blandly colored outfits. Like the you guys do know about the compound with the church out here in Texas that they came and took all the kids away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The women all wear those dresses that are very plain and yeah. Don't kind don't of do like that. Sad. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Something Dude, more creative. Hire, uh, hire a fashion designer. Do it, it can still nudist. be plain. It can Why can't you be nudist? If it's, if it's private eh. enough. Yeah, no, no. You don't want to play golf nude. Yeah, not attractive. This means you have to be nude, just everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Oh, my. All right. So, well, well, do we want to generalize from this? I, I take this attack on metaphysics. I mean, we, we can interpret it in a lot of ways, and some of them, even though I don't like you know, the specific principle of verificationism, I feel like there's something behind it. If these problems, the traditional philosophical problems, existence of God, mind-body relations, if these persist, it's tempting to think that there's, there's something wrong about the way that they're being asked, that there's something wrong with the questions if we just can't get rid of them in any way. And if you take a pragmatic turn, for instance, you could say, depending on what the character of your pragmatism is, that well, since they don't have any, you know, the existence of God, for instance, I'm very much, I've ruled out versions of God that would make me have to suck up to him. Like, those just don't make any sense. Like, why would a God who's so cool want me offering lambs to him or, or wasting my time? <laughs> so I'm not ruling out a God. I've just ruled out the versions of God that would make me do shit. So therefore, 
effectively, it, I don't care. I don't care whether there's a God or not because it has no practical upshot for me. So I guess that's the lesson I get out of this, or that's the variation that I take from some of this. Do you see? Yeah, but your problems are still there, right? Well, yeah, okay. Not being able to create a philosophical system to justify the existence of the being that you think is necessary to underlie your ethical system still doesn't solve your problems for you. All those problems are still there. Well, not all of them. Like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Like, there are lots and lots of ethical problems and things that are, you know, the problem of evil. We talked about in, in the Leibniz one. You could say, oh, this is just an intractable problem. Well, no, just be an atheist, then you don't have a problem of evil. evil there's just evil. <laughs> Solved. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I'm not saying all the problems go away, but some of them sure go away. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of those problems are that close to the problem of evil, where just getting rid of a questionable presupposition will get rid of the problem. Because the assertion, for instance, that it's just grammar, this or that, you know, it's just a uh, illegitimate way of speaking about things. Again, I don't see that you can justify that except by saying what you said, which is that, well, then, then it dispels all the problems. But why well, think the world has to be essentially unproblematic as opposed to problematic? Especially when you consider the fact that it being problematic is built in, even within any scientific system. Once you get to the ultimate premises or the ultimate particles, those things as uncaused, as the first things in the causal chain are essentially irrational. So the problem persists at the level, let's say, of the atomic fact. Once you've boiled everything down, once you've figured out all your laws and gotten to the bottom of things, the bottom of the things is itself unsatisfying and problematic. So Seth, I suppose as a Heideggerian, I know one of his fundamental questions was, why is there something rather than nothing? Which is essentially what Wittgenstein raises here. And I remember studying that and like finding that a not very inspiring question at all. <laughs> So actually, uh, Heidegger's question was not, why is there something rather than nothing? His big question was, we use the term being all the time in lots of different ways. And we talk about being, but nobody's ever sat down and tried to figure out exactly what it is. He does have some lectures, I think, where he addresses that question of why is there something rather than nothing. And it is an issue, but his big issue with being was something different. How do you address the charge that that's just a matter of grammar and that no, no such thing as being as a uh, substantive term. That's just an illegitimate use. I think Russell says something like that in what we read. Show me that that's the case in all or, let's say, most of the languages in the world, and then we'll have that conversation. You're saying that if something's a category mistake, then some languages should not have that mistake in them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or I'm saying that if you're just basically speaking to me in English and you say that English has a grammatical flaw or English has a grammatical structure that makes that confused and what have you. And I would say, okay, what about German or French or Japanese yeah, or Russian? I'm, I'm sympathetic to that as well. Why not think that the categories of language, in fact, are reflective of the categories of existence or, or being? It's hard to give a reason either way. You might suppose that they're deceptive, but I think that's just a bare assertion. Well, one of the points about Wittgenstein we haven't brought up in there, but just to pull this back to Descartes. I mean, a lot of people think that Descartes' emphasis on, on the subject was because of a grammatical mistake that, you know, we say, I think, though there's a subject there, I, but really our experience is just of thoughts. And Wittgenstein makes that exact point that all we have is the contents of our experience. We don't experience an I. So the subject, the metaphysical subject is transcendental as well. It is, Something. but it doesn't mean there's no subject. The I is in the form of the thoughts. To say there's an I, and this goes back to Kant, is to say that these thoughts, they aren't just disparate and unconnected. They are connected within a certain domain. So you can say, yes, there's not an I as a thing or a substance or an object out there in the world, but I think it is helpful to hypothesize it as a form of something or something that's shown. It's a way of saying that these representations are held together in a certain way. That makes sense. Just to read that portion, I, I think he's saying something stronger than that. Right? This is uh, 5.63. I am my world, the microcosm. The thinking presenting subject, there is no such thing. If I wrote a book, the world as I found it, I should also have to have therein to report on my body and say which members obey my will and which do not, etc. This then would be a method of isolating the subject, or rather of showing that in an important sense there is no subject. That is to say, of it alone in this book mention could not be made. 
subject does not belong to the world, but is a limit of the world. Which I don't think he's saying there that, like Kant says, that the I is a is a structure of our experience. I mean, I can't say, oh, what distinguishes my thoughts from your thoughts? Oh, because mine are mine, and they're linked by the ego. Because, really, we don't experience other people's thoughts at all. Right. don't think Kant he, he says, posits an ego as a... Uh... In the I was, I was, guess, I was more thinking Husserl, but I, I think, um, again, he's using that when he says it's, he's absolutely right. Kant would say it's not a thing, too, because uh, again, you're talking about the strict distinction between what's an object within the world and what can only be shown. But it's not just the mind that's in that realm; it's in logic, and it's arguably certain propositions of science. But, but he's not saying, like Wittgenstein says explicitly in other places, stuff like. The relation between the proposition and the fact is something that can't be spoken of, but it can be shown. He doesn't say here that the I is something that is but just shown the it, relationship between the ego and our experience. No, it's just the ego is not part of our experience at all. He's very when much he's, like but Hume. He, he talks about it as the limits of the world, right? I read that passage earlier. I forget which one it is. When he The subject does not belong to the world, but it is a limit of the world. I guess I'm yeah. not sure what that means. Right. He, I, he, see, I take all of on... these things in terms of form. When you distinguish between, say, facts and objects versus which are ultimately empirical versus the forms of things, including you know any structure, including the the law of gravity or anything that's built up out of those bare facts. So much of the world is shown that sense and you know like logic the laws of science it's something shown that's ultimately related to those atomic facts but then when you get to the whole if you try and stand outside of that huge set of facts exhibiting its structure even though the structure is not a thing within it within that set that's where i think you get the sort of uh, metaphysical position and you start talking about subject and this and that see i think when he says the limit it's like he's talking about the limits like a horizon or so later he says, right before that eternal life quote that I had, he says, our life is endless in the way that our visual field is without limit. So, you know, a horizon does not show us the limits of the world. It sort of points to there being something beyond that. I mean, is, I mean, is that... Well, you're talking so about... You're taking, a, we're talking about a limit in one case and then limitlessness in another. A, a, a limit that is limitlessness. Yeah, I, I think that's what he's saying in all these cases, that it points to more things, not transcendental ego things but you know so my visual experience right now my experience of myself is such that i experience that oh i could move 20 feet ahead of me and see some different stuff that's what the limit is is that none of that points to i don't know it, it doesn't seem see what the you're same saying. way that like as, an... as husserl or kant to point to oh there's an ego that's organizing these things it's a much more open-ended I, you know, I, I read something about Wittgenstein, which was to, just to say that Wittgenstein is a you know a straight materialist, which is to say that you know all this really reveals is oh there are more facts out there, more facts, more facts, and they're all going to be well I don't know if materialism is totally relevant there at least on this interpretation that I'd read that these were all going to be still you know material and very mundane relations between individual things. And so that's what sort of the outsideness of our experience is as we experience it, is that there's more of the same if we keep going, just like in math. We know we can keep counting and there'll be more of the same. That unlike Kant, unlike these other folks, the outsideness is not pointing toward transcendental stuff in a positive way. That stuff is just, it's just off limits. It's just outside. It's, it's Again, off limits for Kant, too. Kant isn't, because the ego would be a... Like a ding on Zeke, it's, it's like a convenient model in a way, just like the atom. So you don't say the ego is there causally as if it were this thing that's grind, sure. grinding the thoughts into... It's just the form of the thoughts it shows itself in, in a way, a convenient way of talking about that form is to use yeah, the word I just, ego, I guess I just, even I though that sounds like a reification. But any talk about structure, it sounds like an illegitimate reification, including gravity. I guess I'm just not sure what the structural feature in, in question is here for Wittgenstein. But that's really all, like many of these things, because he should keep talking. He should not just <laughs> say these little cryptic things and move on to something else and make a whole ethical treatise in a matter of 20 lines. He should, like Husserl or like Kant, keep talking until it is clearer what he is talking about. And so that makes me conclude that Wittgenstein is, in fact, an asshole.
Do you do you really <laughs> want him waiting, to write like Husserl? <laughs> Dude, would you really prefer to be reading Husserl? No, actually, what I'd prefer <laughs> is like a modern philosopher. And I'm learning this with a couple of these philosophers of mind. I've been preparing for our philosophy of mind episode that we'll eventually have and reading multiple things by the same authors to sort of see where they are over time. And I know just the way that these academics, they'll write basically the same book again and again and yeah. again. And they'll add some new stuff. And like, you'll, you'll also, so you get the benefit of, uh, their further experience and further thought and you know, other things they've read. And then some of the earlier stuff will focus more on one topic. So it's still worth reading that and not just disregarding it. But if you read enough of it, you really get a damn good picture of what they believe <laughs> and really all the, the points of attack that they consider you know, worth remarking about, about it. Whereas this dude, so he, you know, this was the only book published in his lifetime and the philosophical investigations, which is the other one that you know everybody knows about is I guess something that was part of it was prepared for publication. Part of it is just like journal stuff that's put together. In any case, it's this dude's scratch pad that he's expecting us to follow along with. And that is just fundamentally rude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, something cryptic does maybe get you thinking. I often use that as the definition of good philosophy that what I like to read is stuff that I read a paragraph and then I turn and like write a paragraph myself or write two pages of stuff I don't necessarily do that anymore, but when I was, yeah. you know, especially as an undergrad, like I would just be all over that stuff. On the other hand, if the paragraph that you're writing is trying to figure out what the hell he was trying to say, maybe that's not as fruitful as, you know, the things that drive you to make up your own theories and stuff. Maybe it's just <laughs> distracting from actual thinking that you can be doing, trying to figure out what this doofus is trying to mutter his way through. <laughs> just to leave it on a nasty note. <laughs> Well, this is uh, where I'm not so anti-secondary reading, you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. See what this, other geniuses is, have thought about this. Yeah. This is perhaps the point at which we should remain silent. <laughs> I think that's a good point. <laughs>